Today's gospel story moves back and forth with different emotions. It begins out of fear, thinking Jesus is a ghost, but by the end, they witness, truly, you are the Son of God. Peter steps out boldly with courage, and then he is afraid again, but cries out, Lord, save me. When we hear stories like this, it's we are sort of marvel at them, and we want to say, wow, this is really something. If somebody can walk on water, that really, that must say something about who they are. And indeed it does. We want to hear the story as like a proof that Jesus was God. And in a way, it does that, but not in a conventional way. I would like to suggest that rather than a miracle story, this story might actually be more of an anti-miracle story. For it's really a story about life in the church and about faith. We get a little hint from the story in our own Christian tradition. The word that we use to describe the long, narrow aisle in the, in the medieval churches where the assembly sat, we call that place the nave. This comes from the same Latin word that we use for navy. So we're talking about this long place where all of us sit is called a boat. The church is often referred to from the very beginning as a boat or a ship. And here we have an image of the boat of the church struggling to navigate in rough water, tossed about by waves and storm. So the question is the same for us today as it was for the disciples in the boat. Is God with us or not? God, of course, is the God who first spoke over the waters in the very beginning. When God breathed over the waters, the earth was a formless void. In Hebrew, tohu vabohu. The earth was, a, was void and formless. And God spoke over the waters. Only God can bring order out of chaos. Tohu vabohu. God can bring something out of our nothingness. Only God has power over the waters. Only God can walk on the waters. God is with us, even in the storms of our lives. Jesus comes walking on the water and says, take heart, it is I. It's the same word that we heard earlier this year in the Gospel of John. Jesus In John's Gospel, there are seven I am statements. I'm the bread of life, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the resurrection and the life. Ego in me in Greek, I am. This is the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush when he sent him to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Who shall I say has sent me? Tell him, Ego in me, I am, has sent you. And so at the end of this passage in today's gospel, the disciples can truly say that you are the Son of God. This I am is present to us again over the storms of the waters. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the very end, chapter 28, Jesus repeats this promise. In in the words of Jesus, Jesus says, Behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Matthew began his gospel with that same promise. He said that the child will be called Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. So at the beginning, we have Emmanuel, and at the end, the promise, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, on the mountain, Jesus gathered his disciples to him, and he sent them out to make disciples of all the nations. So he's sending them out beyond Jewish territory. At the end of the Gospel, the mission changes. Now we go out to the nations to the non-Jewish communities to proclaim the good news. So in today's gospel, we have a hint of that new mission. Jesus made his disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Why did the disciples cross the sea? To get to the other side. (laughs) And what's on the other side? The Gentiles. Jesus is sending them out into into non-Jewish territory. So the question that the gospel addresses is Jesus with us, the church, as we journey into uncharted waters. 
The bark of Peter struggles in the world, and Christ appears to be absent. There's another story in the Gospels where there's a storm at sea, but in that story, Jesus is in the boat with the disciples. In fact, he's asleep in the boat, and the disciples awaken him, and he calms the storm. But in this story, Jesus is not in the boat. In fact, Jesus is on the mountain where he has gone to pray. He is alone on the mountain, but of course, he is in communion with God. The mountain is the place where we encounter God. Moses went up on the mountain, and he hid in the cleft of the rock, and the Lord passed by and spoke to him there. And the children of Israel were at the foot of the mountain, and when Moses was up talking to God, there was thunder and lightning which indicated that God was present. In the book of Job, God is silent for 38 chapters, but finally he breaks his silence and speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And so the prophet Elijah, as we heard today in the book of, from 1 Kings, the prophet Elijah wants to have one of these mountaintop experiences like Moses and Job. He's looking for thunder and lightning, earthquake and fire. He's looking for a whirlwind. But God is not in the earthquake. God is not in the fire. God is not in the windstorm. God is heard, finally, in the sound of of sheer silence. God is not revealed in the spectacular. God is revealed in the ordinary moments of our lives, in our living in the world. God does not come to take us out of the challenges and difficulties of life, but rather promises to be present in the midst of our ordinary, everyday experiences. God's promises do not violate the laws of nature, But God is always revealed in the midst of the created world. Nikos Kazantzakis writes, I said to the almond tree, friend, speak to me of God. And the almond tree blossomed. Peter steps out in faith, and then he falters. He cries out, Lord, save me. Eugene Boring comments, What if the message of this text were, faith is not being able to walk on the water, only God can do that, but daring to believe in the face of all the evidence that God is with us in the boat, made real in the community of faith as it makes its way through the storm, battered by the waves. Faith always leaves room for doubt. Last year, Pope Francis gave an interview to all the Jesuit uh, magazines around the world. The, The interview was called A Big Heart Open to God. And the Pope said, if one has the answers to all the questions, that is proof that God is not with him. It means that he is a false prophet, using religion for himself. The great leaders of the people of God, the Pope said, like Moses, have always left room for doubt. You must leave room for the Lord, not for our certainties. We must be humble. Peter had little faith. But Jesus didn't say to Peter, you need more faith. He just commented, you have little faith. And later in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. So what does little faith look like? From time to time, I have to write a letter for somebody. They want to be a godparent for baptism. And the pastor requires a letter to state that this person is a Catholic in good standing. So sometimes I write, oh, so-and-so is a practicing Catholic. They're on the verge of getting it right. (laughs) A couple weeks ago, I was reading the morning Google feed, and I ran across one of our parishioners' names, uh, high school senior at Notre Dame, Aiden Cullen. Uh, in, in July, Aiden blasted a two-run homer at Comerica Park, corralling the most valuable player honors in the 33 annual high school East-West basketball or baseball all-star game. 
he said, wow, he said he was beyond words, just incredible to see the ball fly into the stands. Well, surely that was a pretty big deal. I mean, he even made the, the Google news feed maybe one of the greatest accomplishments of his life. But I have to wonder, how many hours, hours of practice did Aiden put in before he made that hit? Those moments don't come out of nowhere. How many times did he hit the ball and not make a home run? Faith keeps on keeping on. And once in a while, everything comes together. Mother Teresa was on a train traveling to Darjeeling when she heard God speak to her in a very clear and direct way. And it changed her life. She gave up teaching and dedicated her life to taking care of the poor. But God never spoke to her again. I guess she was where God wanted her to be. There was no need to say anything more. Once there was a temple that stood on an island two miles out to sea, and it had a thousand bells, big bells and small bells, bells fashioned by the best craftsmen in the world. And when the wind blew or a storm raged, all the temple bells would peal out in unison, producing a symphony that sent the heart of the hearer into rapture. But over the centuries, the island sank into the sea, and with it, the temple and the bells. Now, an ancient legend said that the bells continued to peal out ceaselessly and could be heard by anyone who listened attentively. And so a young man, inspired by this tradition, traveled thousands of miles, determined to hear those bells. He sat for days on the shore, opposite the place where the temple had once stood, and he listened. He listened with all his heart. But all he could hear was the sound of the waves breaking on the shore. He made every effort to push away the sound of the waves so that he could hear the bells, but to no avail. The sound of the sea seemed to flood the universe. He kept at his task for many weeks, and when he got disheartened, he would go back into the village and ask again about the legend, and the people would say, oh, it is no legend. It is true. You can hear the temple bells. And so he would go back again, but again, he was frustrated, for all he heard was the sound of the waves and the wind as the waves broke upon the shore. Finally, he settled for a middle position. He decided that, in fact, you could hear the temple bells temple bells, but he was not able to hear them. And so, although he was disappointed, he spent one last day at the shore to say goodbye to the wind and the waves, to the sea and the sky. He lay on the sands, gazing up at the sky, listening to the sound of the sea. He did not resist the sound that day. Instead, he gave himself over to it, and he found that it was a pleasant, soothing sound, this roar of the waves. Soon, he became so lost in the sound that he was barely conscious of himself. So deep was the silence that the sound produced in his heart. And in the depth of that silence, he heard it. The tinkle of a tiny bell, followed by another, and another, and another, and soon, every one of the temple bells was pealing out in glorious union, and in his heart, he was transported with wonder and joy. If you wish to hear the temple bells, listen to the sound of the sea. If you wish to see God, look attentively at creation. Don't reject it. Don't reflect on it. Just look at it.